We are glad to welcome our next speakers, Dr. Bettina Palazzo and Richard Bystrong. Bettina has been researching, teaching, and consulting in business ethics for more than 25 years, and she currently prepares future leaders for the new world of responsible business through her course at the University of Geneva. She believes leaders need to understand why performance pressure can push their people over the ethical edge and how they can create a team culture where long-term success is more important than short-term profits. Richard Bystrong spent his career as an international sales executive. In 2007, he was targeted by the US Department of Justice and in that same year, he assisted the US, UK and other governments in understanding FCPA, bribery and other export violations in international sales. In 2012, Richard was sentenced as part of his own plea agreement and served 14 and a half months at a federal prison camp. Now, through his consultancy, he conducts corporate workshops and keynotes at global multinationals. In his work, he says, ethics and compliance teams are not there to make tough decisions for leaders, but to support them in coming up with responsible choices even under economic pressures. Hello, I'm very thrilled to be here. Hi, Richard, how are you doing today? I'm oh, we don't hear you well. yet. Oh, now we hear you, great. Good, so Richard, today we will talk about performance under pressure. And I thought we'll dive right in. You recently wrote a piece in Fast Company about what is happening in if people and especially high performers are put under pressure, what does it do to ethics and compliance? Let's hear your thoughts on this, please. Well, good afternoon again, Bettina. It's such a pleasure to join everyone and thank you the ECEC for the opportunity and the invitation. So Bettina, let's level set here. Right now we are in an environment uh, and I think we should first level set, do we agree on this? Where teams face enormous volatility, economic pressure. We also are working in this new hybrid and remote environment, which I think, and the research also backs this up, can lead to what we might think of as a lot of me, me, and me thinking where those who might be working remotely have less contact and communications with the home office, so to speak, might feel a little detached. They might want to demonstrate their virtual worth to the organization by maybe taking what might even be some well-intentioned or what they might think of as innocent shortcuts. And there is a one of the articles that you referenced is about the risks of high performers being more prone to ethical lapses. I mean, there's really some disturbing research. I know we have some friends from E and Y today joining us, and they had some research that published that talked about how there is an increase in how ethical and compliance lapses from high performers are more likely to be tolerated in the organization. And why? Because they think right now there's such a focus on commercial success and getting the business done mm -hmm. and maybe less focus or maybe distraction as to the importance of how business gets done. And I'm looking forward to exploring more of this with you. And that I think this me, me and me thinking, how do I mm -hmm. demonstrate my value? my success can really lead to a very dangerous financial gain and success addiction. So maybe we can talk about what are we celebrating? What are we acknowledging? Mm -hmm. And how are we defining failure? Maybe those could be a few points that we share today. But I think that whether someone's in a new role, a new job, we, we might call it transformation, right? But in any sort of career changing moment, that to me, all I hear is risk. Right. And we're not here to wait for on success, but I think we have to acknowledge some of the real risks that are out there. And hopefully to ask ourselves, if we know this anxiety and uncertainty 
Mm. and volatility exists, are we waiting for people to call us to ask for help? Or are we personally intervening proactively to help people out there that we know need help and that face very difficult circumstances? Right. So Bettina, to avoid and mitigate this me, me and me mentality, what do you think? Yes, I think it's a sign we, we concentrate and we kind of get pushed into this tunnel vision if we're under pressure. And we know this from, from many, many uh, studies and research how this, this combination of performance pressure and uh, time pressure can push people really over the ethical edge. I'm, I'm fascinated by one example that I came across uh, in a book on crucial conversations that said that when, when are the most safety breaches happening on an oil platform. And there are actually exactly two situations where, the, where people don't care about security anymore. And that's the one when the oil platform is uh, on a breakdown, so it doesn't work for the moment. And here we need to know that um, if an oil platform is up and running, it makes a quarter of a million dollars a, d a day. So we can, so here we have performance pressure if people know, people of course know this and so they go they do whatever it takes to have this money making machine up and running again and they cut corners yeah? maybe little things but in in work safety we have to be attentive all the time otherwise um, uh, well there are in general no intelligent accidents and we have to be very into the detail and the second situation where people cut corners on work safety is when a thunderstorm is coming up. So they are under time pressure and they need to buckle up and uh, tighten everything together. Uh, so and and if we look at all your favorite corporate scandals in the last 10 years, you will always find this deadly combination of performance and time pressure. And I'm also fascinated what you wrote in your other uh, article about so what does this mean this performance and time pressure is there almost unavoidable in the corporate world and what but what does this mean if we we take it to the hybrid and remote workplace what's uh, and so what what have you observed does this does this lead to more misconduct or less what I have seen, the, the studies kind of show both, uh, but uh, what, how can we mm, work on a culture of integrity in a hybrid or remote workplace? What, what are your ideas on this? Well, in the Fast Company article, there was some really in interesting research that I dived into, and I think we have to be careful for a few things here, Bettina. Number one is proximity bias. Mm -hmm. Who do we tend to spend the most time with? Who are we most engaged with? Mm -hmm. Who can we get sort of a reading as to how they're doing? The people that we're in front of. Maybe it's around the water cooler or the espresso machine, but these are the people that we tend to spend the most time with. And perhaps not intentionally, but with proximity bias, we are less concerned with the people that we're not in front of. So the question is, how can we switch that around? Because the people that we are no longer seeing as much that we used to see are the ones that we really need that connection with. And that doesn't need to be a, a fancy mm -hmm. webinar or a team meeting or Zoom. I, I, I think I'm gonna just keep on this theme of personal interventions. Mm -hmm. And if we know that some of our remote teams and risk can be mapped, as we know, are facing difficult circumstances, what about just picking up the phone and saying, how are things going? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sorry we don't get to see each other as much. You know, how, how can we better help you in the environment that you face? Like, even though you're not here, we still care about you. And again, I think that helps to mitigate mm -hmm. the former Richard mindset of because I was traveling 250 days a year overseas for 10 years wow. remote work is nothing new mm -hmm. but it's very easy to become detached from the home office 
And as we know, Bettina, and I think we share this common passion for research, what influences us the most when it comes to ethical decision making? One of the top five is our environment. Mm. So when people are detached from the home office, are we intervening to make sure that we, they know that we care not only about their success, but their safety? And I think another way we can do that is look at the onboarding process. I had the pleasure of being in Toulouse last week uh, at a wonderful conference. One of the organizations was talking about how they hired, I think, almost 10,000 workers in the last uh, few years. So, Bettino, what is the process for ethical onboarding for new employees mm. that might be working remotely? And, and who's doing that? Is HR doing it? Is uh, compliance doing it? Or the bigger challenge, are supervisors setting those ethical expectations? So those are a few challenges I think we can think about in this hybrid and remote environment. Yeah, that's super interesting, Richard. And uh, going back to your input on on the whole scenario, two, two buzzwords came to my mind. The one is context and connectedness. We see more and more that uh, the, the ethics and compliance in an organization doesn't depend, does of course depend of having uh, ethical people in, in your company, but the context and what you create in your commu in communicating and connecting on ethical dilemmas and normalizing that you talk about these things uh, play a, maybe an even stronger uh, role than codes of conduct and, and reminding people what they should do. So that's the one thing, uh, connection and context. And the other one is fairness. As you said, so do I concentrate on, uh, on what people do I concentrate on? And this relates a lot to who gets my appreciation? It's like, you know, when humans are hardwired to, to fairness. And if you have siblings, we all know, we, we watched very careful who gets mom's or dad's attention most for what. And it's, it, it doesn't, we take this kind of emotional baggage to our workplace and we are very sensitive to how much, who gets what kind of goodies and appreciation. And I guess that's something that would, that would lead to, to the role of ethical leadership, that leaders tend to forget about how important they, uh, that they are always under observation, how they distribute their attention. So that's something I think leaders need to take care of. And and this, and now I will get to the onboarding part. So, who takes care of the of um, onboarding people? And the Jesuits used to say, you need to get them young. You want to establish what role ethics and compliance plays in a company from day one when somebody comes. So, I've been working with a um, consulting company. And I, I train their new hires every month because they have lots of new people coming in on the respect on the workplace. And I think this is a great way to open, to, to create the safe space where you communicate, hey, this is something that's important to us and we give you the tools and we want to hear from you if you are not happy with how we handle uh, respect. So in doing something like this in cooperation with HR and other internal players, I think that's a, a, a very promising venue for compliance to get really into uh, not being isolated in one area of the company, but kind of get into all the management systems and in the hearts and minds of their people. Well, Katina, I just wanted to mm -hmm. pivot on one of the key words from what you just shared, normalization, mm -hmm. right? Who normalizes and who operationalizes ethics and integrity? You know, Bettina, when, when I hear we have a just say no policy to bribery, I call that a wall poster. Yeah. Right? Does that really operationalize? Does that normalize ethics and integrity? Because my experience with corruption in South America was very different than what I experienced in the Middle East. Mm. So this is not a one-size-fits-all problem or solution. 
So my question for those joining us today is who is normalizing, who is operationalizing ethics and compliance? Because from former commercial Richard and current compliant Richard, I think Bettina, when the only people are talking about ethical expectations, it sounds like here, uh, responsible business practices are a support function. But yeah. when it's coming out of the supervisors, when the supervisors are part of onboarding and setting ethical expectations, mm. it sounds like here in our organization, doing what's right isn't a compliance function. It's how we get things done because it's coming through the corporate narrative, not just the compliance narrative. And, and Bettina, I see this in my client work. Mm -hmm. I think we're stuck here a little bit. Yeah because I think business leaders right now are distracted. They are rewarding success. There's a lot of financial gain addiction out there. Mm -hmm. And are we also setting expectations for what happens if we fail? Yeah. Do people fear failing? Do they know that success isn't always sustainable over a long period of time? So are we thinking maybe a little bit more about, as you shared, what we're celebrating and also sometimes maybe it's worth celebrating failure, which I can't read about, can't wait to read about in Amy Edmondson's new book, The Right Kind of Failure, The Science of Failing Well. Actually, it's called The Right Kind of Wrong. <laughs> so I think this will tell us a lot about how failure can be used to, to help an organization by creating that psychologically safe environment where people can speak up. So let me ask you a question, right. Bettina. You know, I've, I've, we've met in person and a lot of my thoughts were born in your kitchen <laughs> over a nice dinner. And I'd like to hear what you have to share about how compliance leaders perceive how ethics and compliance is not essential for them. In fact, they might even think that it's slowing them down and inhibiting their success. So going back to getting a little stuck, how do we mitigate that kind of mindset? Yeah, yeah I, I hear this also a lot from my clients that, oh, it's so hard to win our leaders for compliance. And uh, it, it kind of comes with the setup if you have a compliance department and then they, they have, uh, it's all on them to push uh, compliance on other people and, and you already feel like almost physically if you want to push stuff on people what you get you get resistance it's it's very hard to avoid because especially if uh, your people they have different priorities they are they have a, a long to this to-do list they want to reach their numbers uh, they are under a time pressure performance pressure and then comes compliance and spoils the party with another process and have you thought about this no we can't do that uh, um, have you filled out this uh, very boring formula where you don't really understand why it's important so it's uh, mm, but in here we can learn a lot from Mark marketing where they say okay you can push stuff on people it's it's okay for certain things like the, like the must do's like work security where it's really important that you told them but you can we also need the pool so how how do you get them and and you need to mm, so how do you do this in marketing? It's um, there's this mantra of marketing, which is who is my target group? What, how do they tick? So get to know your people, go out there and talk to them and also show that you are a nice person, right? Not the scary compliance officer. <laughs> and uh, then you find out what are their compliance pain points? Where do they struggle instead of just sending them uh, the one, as you said, Richard, the one size fits all uh, corruption and bribery policy that where, but in reality, the messy reality, as you said, in South America is completely different in, 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 the, in the Far East. So how do you adapt? What are the stories behind it? And then you have to, so the third part of the marketing mantra is the, what is your solution for them? So you don't, you want to turn it around and not say this is the rule and we will spoil your business, but tell them, you know, uh, if you do it that way, we can figure out, um, uh, go into problem solving together and turn this more into an opportunity. Bec but, but, but it's, I'm, 
I'm not saying it's easy because the fundamental conflict of, of goals is for compliance, keeping your people safe and successful in the long run, whereas your people, they are in the here and now and they need to make the numbers this quarter and it needs to be this number and if not, if not, and that's super important, what is the if not? And, and you, you mentioned it also in your article, we need to make, uh, so how do we deal if you not, if you don't achieve your numbers for this quarter, but you stayed clean? Can we, can we not celebrate this? And, and people are not sure what happens to them because there's often a double bind situation where, of course, in the code of conduct stands, well, even if you lose business or it takes longer time, please adhere to our highest principles of ethics. But will people will, will only believe this if they hear the right kind of gossip in their company, where they hear, oh, Richard did not get this stellar deal because he didn't want to pay a... I'm simplifying here, of course. He didn't want to pay a bribe, so he is the hero of the month. But we, I don't think we have these kind of stories yet. And that's why we kind of stuck in compliance. So, so those are great points. And I think, you know, people who walked away from business, whether that's on procurement or sales for the right reason, mm -hmm. like, why aren't we celebrating that? Because when we do celebrate it, we send two messages. Number one, we always appreciate and celebrate people who do things for the right reason, even if it's at the cost of business. You know, that can be a wall poster if it just stays in the code of conduct, right. Bettina. But when we, when we celebrate it, we send that message, but we send an even more important message. And that is we protect people who do what's right, no matter what. Yeah. So, you know, we go back to marketing. These events can be anonymized. Mm -hmm. They can be shared. And they send such a, a loud message to the workforce. And going back to Amy Edmondson's first book, The Fearless Organization, which is just a fundamental read, she talks about dangerous silence, Bettina. And dangerous silence is when mm. people, like the former commercial Richards, who are trying to figure out risk while they're, they're in the middle of it, aren't calling for help. They're not sharing that they're confused, that they're right. struggling how to succeed without sacrifice integrity integrity but bettina no one's calling them when they should be calling them and to say we haven't been hearing from you we know you face difficult mm. circumstances we're here to help because the research is clear yeah no one is going to come to you for the first time if they have an issue if they don't know you right so your point about establishing those relationships when there is not a crisis at hand, yeah. dramatically increases the probability that people will reach out for help and support when they do face a crisis. So it goes back to those proactive interventions and especially with new hires, early interventions. The earlier you're establishing those relationships with new hires, because we don't know what their background is, we don't know what their prior organization was, the better. Right. Yeah, I always compare this a little bit with um, couple therapy. <laughs> you you need to do this early and you shouldn't do it. You, what couple therapists usually tell you is that if you come too late, then it's not uh, it's, it's hard to save the couple. So we, you should do it proactively. And there's also very interesting uh, research saying that how do you get a speak up culture? You not so much by telling people, well, please tell me your critical, uh, potentially career terminating uh, opinion. And no, uh, you, you need to solicit it uh, proactively and uh, don't don't wait for them to come to you and they don't really know what to expect but give them again normalize it that you uh, create the space where you ask people for for speak up so solicitating speak up is much more powerful i think the number in that survey was six times higher if you frequently ask about it so people can experience that it's safe and worthwhile if they say something. So that, that's the most important thing that people don't speak up because they are afraid 
and they think it won't help. So this is something that, that um, leaders need to learn how to turn around. And the same is true for the role of compliance. You need to also brand and market yourself as uh, not the scary compliance person, but somebody you can come to and trust to. So you, how can you do this? You, can, you need to build your brand and take every opportunity to show that you are understanding, that you're not uh, judging, you, wanna, you, you want to understand and help and get into problem solving. Yes, and a lot of my clients and on the compliance side, even if they don't have a formal speaking role or workshop or panel at business meetings, they show up anyway, Yeah. right? And they're there at meals, they're there at breaks, they're there during the evening, and they're getting to know people because mm -hmm. if we want to lose the scary compliance image, well, people have to get to know us and to say, this is someone that's really, you know, interesting. That's cool. And I know I can definitely call them if I'm yeah. facing an issue. Because I think, Bettina, we share uh, some friends and colleagues with Anna Romberg and Michaela Alberg, who mm -hmm. wrote this wonderful book called The Gray Zone. Mm -hmm. And going back to your keyword of resistance, right? Yeah. They use the word friction. And yeah. friction can be good. Right? Friction can be a sign that your yeah. program is working. Because if your commercial teams are, are pushing back on you and saying, this is really a difficult situation, can we maybe yeah. improve this process? That's the best news at all, of all, because it means that they're taking it seriously and asking you for help. Yeah, that's uh, very important that you, that you show that, yeah, that you are there to help them and will not blame them. Huh? That, but that's difficult because can be challenging for compliance because people sometimes do stupid stuff, right? And uh, so, so don't don't give them the I told you so, <laughs> but get, get into this problem solving. And the, the most important thing that to keep in mind here, if you if you want to win people for rules, you need to work on the relationship first, because rules without relationship. If you have teenagers at home, <laughs> I mean, well, you know they lead to rebellion. And how do you, do you create a good relationship? You need to communicate. You need to under make people understand what your role is, why it's important, why this rule is important, and yeah, show them what's in it for them. Uh, I love that. Rules without relationships. Yeah, it's great, right? Rules without relationships are not effective. And I, I will say, Bettina, going back to the hybrid work, because right now there's like, we're in the office three days a week and there's mm -hmm. all this rotation. Mm -hmm. Why not be more intentional about it? If you're a compliance leader and you know that your teams do cycle into the office from time to time, why not ask, when are you going to be in? Because mm -hmm. I wanna make sure that those are the days that I'm also coming to the office. Yeah. But right now, it just seems to be random as who's there on a particular day when I think we can be more intentional about it and to say, I want to make sure I'm here when you're here yeah. so we finally get to see one another. Yeah, this intention is a great buzzword, Richard, because what we need to understand in compliance also, is you are competing on people's attention. And, and of course, compliance did people in compliance did go into compliance and not into sales, but they need to understand that actually they're also in sales. So uh, you are competing for everybody's attention, so make it atten intentional. Know how your target group ticks, how they want to be, how they want to communicate when they are there, what are their channels they prefer. It, it depends very much if you want to communicate with people in production sites, you need to choose a different channel, different methods than with your HR people or your uh, marketing people or your sales people. No, that's a great point. The mm. first time a compliance leader calls someone in the field and says, it's me, I just want to see how things are going, uh -huh. anything I can help you with, I promise they're going to be thinking, okay, what's the real, um, what's the real motive behind this call? But, you know, Bettina, mm -hmm. the second time you make that call, 
and say, how are things going? And Amy Edmondson has some great open-ended questions. And the third time, at some point, the mentality will shift. Mm -hmm. And people will think, I really do have a team that is showing a duty of care for me. Yeah. And you know what? I might have even made some mistakes in the past. And instead of burying them and hoping they go away, you know, maybe I should talk about that. So again, yeah. early interventions, proactive intervention, let's mitigate that dangerous silence. And if you know teams are facing difficult situations and they're not calling you, I guess the big question is, are you calling them? Yeah, it's that's an important point, Richard, because you won't ethics and compliance is not something you want to surprise people with. You're like you send out a code of conduct or you, you, you suddenly tell them, oh, now we have this speak up system. Uh, so uh, it, it's a marathon and you need to. So that's kind of the, the tough part of being in compliance. It's a marathon and you have to rely on baby steps. So if you call people once and, and they will not open up to you immediately, it's normal. You have to keep doing it and showing up, as you said, also showing up in all kinds of, of, of places. Use all the platforms you can use, find, get, get together with your communication team, know who your internal stakeholders, your allies are, that you can get on board with you because I guess that's a very important thing. You're not supposed to do it alone as compliance. Yeah, and then um, maybe we also have this idea that we, we, well, we are, this is our compliance head. We are responsible for this. We need to do it alone. No, you don't. You're actually much stronger if you win lots of allies for your cause. No. And, and maybe we even need to reframe a little bit the word speak up, because mm -hmm. it seems that that's putting all the pressure on the person. Like, oh, you know, it's my responsibility mm -hmm. to speak up. I have to take the risk. Am I going to lose the respect of my peers? Is, is anything going to happen? So maybe we, the, the bigger question is, should we be listening up? Right. And let's right. take some of the pressure off of the individual and make it easier to have those two-way communications, but take some of the burden off of the person who's responsible for speaking up and let's be better listeners. Yeah, that's super important, Richard. And that's where we have the role of leaders kicking in again, because people usually don't turn instantly to compliance if they have an ethical concern. They look how their leaders behave. Are they speaking up to their superiors? Yes, no. Uh, are they open? Can I, do I have the trust that I go to them with uh, uncomfortable things? How will they react? And that's not easy. Nobody likes this kind of feedback where we might be challenged by somebody is just implying that we might not be good persons. Uh, so it's very hard not to become defensive there. So that's something that needs to be trained. And there are lots of great tools out there how you can deal with this differently and um, don't take feedback personnel on these topics, but look at them and see what can we use from this? How can we get into problem solving and getting curious? I think. So, so my, my, my most important message for compliance people is uh, get curious and find out what the root causes are to come up with better solutions with your people. Very well said. And mm -hmm. like, like you said with the marriage counselor, <laughs> you know, ethical <laughs> challenges age like milk. They do not age like wine. So the more you're being a good listener, and encouraging people to share their challenges, the faster they're going to do it. So some really wonderful mm. points here. Mm. And, and let's just think about what are we incentivizing? What are we celebrating? Yeah, you know, those are the messages that we're sending to the, to the workforce. Uh, so I think there's a lot of power in celebrating the right kinds of failures and to having business normalize ethics and integrity, not just compliance. Yeah, so so important, the whole incentive system. We, it's very complex, of course, and 
uh, companies are trying, but the, there's lots of research out there that shows how incentive system can be bad for ethics, but we haven't really figured out good incentive systems for ethics yet, and it's very dangerous because you never know what people will make with incentive systems. They can always game them. Uh, so um, I think we need to focus more in, on the intrinsic value of, of compliance and motivate people not out of fear and to avoid risk, but because this is the kind of company we want to be. Uh, that, that's probably... Uh, a, very, a much more powerful way and much safer way than just throwing monetary incentives on it. I'm looking yeah, to please. our moderator. Um, Fantastic. Betty for <laughs> questions. From Bettina, thank you so much yeah, for a wonderful a interview. Pleasure. Richard, thank you too. It's wonderful to have this commercial perspective, I right, think, on compliance. Very it's a very fresh mm -hmm. perspective. Dear ECEC attendees, thank you for sending in your questions. We've got a couple of questions for you. So let's take a look. Janina Aufrichtig asks, mm -hmm. isn't there an urge to redefine mm. performance? Yeah. Have there been any notable developments according to your practical experience? Richard, would you like to answer that first and then yep. Bettina? Did you, did you so hear I've the question, seen... Richard? So is I, there... I, thank you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I think there are some interesting and innovative practices that I've seen. So for example, are you rewarding people for building diverse teams? Are you rewarding people for taking ESG initiatives? Uh, are you rewarding people for inviting their ethics and compliance leaders to speak at your business meetings? And are you thinking about maybe rewarding performance, not just based on individual performance, but on group performance? So um, I'll turn it over to Bettina, but mm. your reward and incentive systems are like the side of a bottle of prescription medications. They all have scary side effects. Right. So as compliance leaders, are you there and do you have a voice to make sure that those side effects of your reward systems align with your values, your code, your mission, and your purpose? Yeah. So thank you. Great question. Yeah. And there are a lot of good, innovative solutions out there. Okay. Would you like to add anything to that? But yeah, about it's, rewarding it's also tricky because uh, incentive systems are usually owned in a company by HR. Mm -hmm. So there you need you need to cooperate. And it's uh, and usually... From what I hear, nobody is really happy with the incentive system they're having. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very tricky thing. Uh, so, so, my, so pinpointing, because you, for eth how can you come up with measurable behavior for, for ethics? And it's very mm -hmm. hard because mm -hmm. it's very hard to, to, to handle. So, and one example where it didn't work out was at Uber, where they wanted to incentivize managers to have diverse teams. Mm -hmm. and more women in their teams. And what happened, they just, uh, uh, when they had women in their teams, they just didn't li let them move anymore because they wanna keep, wanted to keep the, the women there so they would get their bonus for that. So we, we never know, as Richard said, uh, the, the side effects are very hard to predict. So that, that's why I would say, let's just maybe try the intrinsic motivation first, link it with your values, link it, link it with um, your, your purpose and, and keep showing up for it. I mean, you, you need to prove that you're really serious about it to go beyond these posters that, uh, that mm -hmm. Richard said, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Great mm -hmm. points there. Mm -hmm. We have another question. Um, what shall a compliance officer do if there is no support oh. from top management in being compliant? Oh, yeah. Leave the company, or do you have a different <laughs> suggestion? <laughs> Where should well, we start? Yeah. It, 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 of course, it depends how bad it is. I hear this all the time. So what compliance officers need to be very careful before they onboard any company to really find out how serious is your leader. And bef if you have doubts there, don't take the job mm -hmm. uh, if, if you have the luxury of choosing. And, but even then... Uh, sometimes uh, the, to the missing tone of the top is not really bad intention. It's just that these people have so much on their on their plate that they are also overwhelmed. They don't, don't they don't really understand what's in it for them, and they don't really know what to do it. So what you can always do as a compliance professional is prepare them 
interesting, give them interesting tools so they can easily come up with personal stories about why this is important. So I, I was coaching an executive team, for example, a couple of uh, two years ago, and, and I gave them lots of prompts to think about, so why is ethics and compliance specifically important for your company? What's the most important value or issue in your code of conduct? And one of them shared the story that uh, his grandfather uh, couldn't hear very well because he had um, gone deaf for working in a very noisy factory. So that's why work security was super important for him. And he was a little bit scared if he should share this very personal story because it made him feel vulnerable. So we, we need, and Richard had this also in his, in his um, article that we need different kinds of corporate heroes. What are we celebrating uh, leaders for? And we, we see this in the media all the time. There are little CEOs that we celebrate for their ethical leadership. Mm -hmm. yeah, more the contrary, right? So that, that's something I think that's important. So mm, compliance can do something, but there are of course limits. Mm -hmm. And making yeah. it relevant to yeah. the business so as make well. Make it relevant for them, stay in touch with them. Of well, you, it, it's a thin line between, okay, you have to show them that there are risks for them, but you know, risk is not such a good motivator. Fear is not a good motivator because people always, especially high-level leaders, think, oh, it won't happen to me. Mm. And we all have this. We, oh, no, it won't happen here. Mm -hmm. We are all good people. Right. Um, uh, but so show them more something positive. How, what does it do for your image as a leader? Uh, a little bit of feel good about okay, yourself. We, we, yeah. Time is almost up. Richard, yeah. would you like to add anything to that? What can yeah. a compliance director do to see if the CEO is not compliant or the company is not compliant? Would you, should mm. he leave or do you have one, one other yeah. tip you'd like to add um, to Bettina's comments? So the short answer is, you know, freshen up your resume on that one because <laughs> it's a lot of countries. Uh, if there's an issue, mm. they want to hear, and they've been very clear about this, they're going to want to hear from the compliance <laughs> leaders what happened. Yeah. So you are putting yourself at professional risk yeah, if you're working in an organization that mm. doesn't support it. And I would just, you know, end with Bettina's use of the corporate hero touches a real nerve with me because I thought of myself as the corporate hero. Mm -hmm. And once you get corporate hero status, you never want to give it up. So mm -hmm. if you're defining your corporate heroes as financial gain heroes, mm -hmm. as success heroes in a financial way, you're putting everybody at risk because they are now in the rabbit hole of success and they will do anything, including taking risk, as we learned in this article, to make sure they keep that status. So let's be careful about who are our corporate heroes. Thank you so much. Richard, thank, thank you, Richard. you so much. And Bettina, I've loved this. Great um, how you've balanced each other out on your points of view. We've really brought loads to the discussion on performance under mm -hmm. pressure. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Big pleasure.